Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rosemary Rung, and I am chair of the H737 PFAS Commission. Um, because we are meeting remotely, um, I have to read a right-to-know script to begin the meeting. Uh, today, we will be um, having a meeting of the HB737 PFAS Commission. Before we get started, I'll read through a checklist to ensure that the meeting that we are holding is in compliance with the right to know law. As chair of the HB 737 commission, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12 pursuant to executive order 2020-04 and its extensions, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. In accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that, number one, we are providing public access to the meeting by telephone with additional access possible by video and other electronic means. We are utilizing Go to meeting webinar for this electronic meeting. All members of the committee and selected legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously in this meeting through this platform. And the public has access to contemporaneously watch and or listen to the meeting on GoToWebinar and via phone by following the directions and links provided on the general court website. We have provided public notice of the necessary information for accessing the meeting in the House calendar. We are providing a mechanism for the public to alert the public body during the meeting if there are problems with access. If anyone has a problem, please email amy.russo at des.nh.gov. Again, that's amy, A-M-Y, dot russo, R-O-U-S-S-E-A-U, at des.nh.gov or by phone at 603-848-1372. Again, that's 603-848-1372. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, we will be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note that all votes taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Finally, let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states their presence, please also state where they are and if anyone else is in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. So I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Uh, thank you, Representative Brung. Uh, Mr. Ayotte, not see. Okay. Uh, Mr. Bandesian. Uh, present in, in my office in Manchester alone. Okay, Representative Bohm. Here at home in the room by myself. Thank you, Dr. Bush. Morning, everyone. I'm here in my office in Concord alone. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Carson, I don't see. Um, Representative Cretion. Muted. Yeah, Representative Cretion, I, I think you still have to mute on there. I'm sorry. Yes, I am here. I am in my home office in Manchester. And I'm Thank you. Uh, Ms. Costello could not join us today. Uh, Senator Daniels. Senator Gary Daniels, I'm at my home in Milford and I'm alone. Thank you. Um, the clerk, uh, Nikki Forty, I am at my house in Litchfield and I am alone. Um, Ms. Harrington. Hi, I am in my home office in Merrimack and I'm alone. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Healy. In my home office alone in Merrimack also. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Mesmer. I am alone in my office in Rhine, New Hampshire. Thank you, Representative Mooney. Here in Merrimack, at home, alone. Thank you, uh, Ms. Murphy. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am present at home in Merrimack in a room by myself. 
Thank you. Uh, Miss Paradise, has she joined us? Don't see. Nope. Um, yeah. Representative Rung. Uh, I am in my home office in Merrimack and alone. Thank you. Mr. Wimsat. Yes, good morning. I'm uh, in my home office in Concord and I'm alone. Okay, and uh, Representative Woods. I don't see. Oh, you know, he, he he told me he wasn't going to be able to join. I'm sorry, Nikki, I forgot. Okay, no worries. Okay, um, that is everyone. I believe we're good. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes uh, from February 12th. Um, I would entertain a motion to accept the minutes as amended. So moved. Or, as submitted. You should have gotten them Monday. I'll move the minutes, Senator Daniels. Okay, so and, um, second. and Councillor Harrington um, seconds. Are there any additions, corrections to the minutes? Okay, and I want to thank Ms. Wardy very much for those thorough minutes. Uh, they give a great record of the meeting. Um, okay, seeing no changes, um, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll to approve the minutes that's submitted. Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Van Dazian. I believe you're muted, Mr. Van Dazian. Yes. Okay. Uh, Representative Bohm. Abstain because I wasn't here. There. Okay. Dr. Bush. Yes. And Representative Cretion. Yes. <clears throat> Senator Daniels. Yes. Uh, Ms. Forty, clerk votes yes. Ms. Harrington. Yes. Representative Healy. Yes. M Ms. Mesmer. Yes. Representative Mooney. Same. Okay. Uh, Ms. Mus uh, Ms. Murphy. Look. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Representative Rung. Yes. And Mr. Wimsat. Yes. Okay, motion passes. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Forty. Um, we've had a full commission for the past two months, and I just wanted to give one last opportunity if anyone wanted to nominate a new chair, since this is the full commission after the last election. Um, if does anyone want to bring any nominations to the floor? Uh, Representative Rung, Senator Daniels, uh, I, I would be willing to chair if it is the desire of the commission. I'd like to be recognized to make a nomination. Yes, Representative Mooney. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to nominate Senator Gary Daniels of Milford to chair the commission. Okay, I'll second that. Okay, Representative Bill seconds. Okay, is there any other nominations to come before the floor? Uh, Ms. Mesmer? I'd like to nominate Rosemary Ron to continue in the position as chair. Okay. Second. And there is a second. Second. Okay. Representative, okay. You've got Mr. Okay, so we have two nominations on the floor. Um, you know, actually, I'm unsure of the parliamentary procedure on this. Do we vote on the first nomination um, or the second? Does anyone? I'm sorry, I'm not. Uh, help out. Anybody know the. <laughs> All right. Why don't we Why don't we vote on the the first nomination on the floor? Okay. Right. So the motion is to vote for Senator Daniels to chair the HB seven thirty seven commission. Uh, Ms. Ford, would, you, would you call the roll, please? Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Mooney. Uh, just sort of a parliamentary inquiry. It, do the two candidates want to make some remarks prior That's to the vote? Okay, that's a great idea. Senator Daniels, would you like to make some remarks on your nomination? Sure, thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I'd be interested in it. I've been following this uh, and following your, your deliberations for a, a few months now, and uh, I I think I could probably bring, bring in uh, some uh, new direction, other things that maybe we need to look at to move the Commission along in, in some some ways it seems to become a little bit stagnant. Uh, I look at things like the uh, the health so subcommittee 
that uh, and the uh, the other one that wasn't met uh, very often. Um, I'm also checking in the, in the Senate, and I understand that there have been a, an issue with resources on be able on being able to have the subcommittees meet. So I think the Senate may be able to uh, be able to supply some of those resources. Um, but, but I'm interested in all of the opinions that everyone has because as I as I look over the screen, there's a lot of information and knowledge there that we can put together and uh, draw some some of these things that we've been working on to conclusion. Okay. Are there any questions of Senator Daniels? Okay, seeing none. Yes, oh, like to... yes uh, in the past when the Senator Deesh was the chair, she provided with um, resources that we as reps don't have, but the Senator has for um, scheduling those meetings and whatnot. And that will your staff be able to help with that? I think we, we, we probably can, depending on the schedule that's set up. Uh, I checked uh, recently, and uh, if we continue to have the meeting as we're having now, this one here, I think, is, is being run by DES. Right. Uh, but uh, f certainly Fridays seem to be more open uh, for subcommittee meetings. Again, I don't know uh, how that works out with members on the subcommittee meet meeting, but I believe that we can find times to do that uh, that can work around the particularly the, the ways and means and the finance schedule. Uh, that coming up. Those are going to be the heavy things that are coming coming up over the next couple months. Uh, yes, Representative Creason. Hi, thank you, and thanks for taking my question. Um, you mentioned a few things that you felt like were were stagnant and could be moved forward. Do you have any examples of um, specifics there that you're thinking well, of? Okay, so uh, one of the things I was looking at, and I know that this whole committee is about uh, PFAS, but I don't know, and I haven't seen anything that identifies what the harmful PFAS is versus the not so harmful when, when it comes to things like drinking water. And I know there are thousands of compounds out there. So uh, that's something that the Environment Committee could probably look at in separating those off and uh, actually more getting more communication out to the public so that it's a, it's an educational effort to get them uh, informed on what's happening in their community and and draw draw the uh, interest and the comment from them as well. Um, any other questions of Senator Daniels? Okay, seeing none. Um, I, I'll offer my remarks. Um, I know it has been a real struggle with these meetings since COVID uh, hit. It was difficult to transition to remote meetings, but we did it successfully. And um, as the uh, statutory or the standing committees uh, started meeting and we lost our resources from the House, uh, I think we've done a good job um, with DES's help to get these meetings regularly scheduled. Um, we has just told us that they can now schedule our subcommittee meetings, which is something we've been pursuing for a couple months. So I think some of the issues Senator Daniels raised has have been resolved. Um, <clears throat> I also want to address a comment he made about PFAS, that some may be harmful and some may not be harmful. Um, I think we all have to acknowledge that all PFAS present a risk because they are non-biodegradable. Every single one. Um, accumulates in the environment. And I think having some basic understanding of that chemistry and to understand what studies have been done so far, which has established a causal relationship between PFAS and health impacts, it's important to bring that experience to this commission. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy to carry on as chair. And I'd like to think I've done a great job, but you're the best judge of that. And so that will be reflected in the vote. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions anyone has. Seeing none, uh, we'll vote on the motion for Senator Daniels to assume the position of chair of the commission. Uh, Ms. Forty, would you call the roll, please? 
Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Bandazian. Mm -hmm. Representative Bohm. Senator Daniels. Okay. Dr. Bush. I'm going to abstain as sort of a, a member here at, representing the health department. Understood. Uh, Representative Christian. Uh, no. Okay. Uh, Senator Daniels. Yes. Okay. Uh, the clerk, Ms. Forty, votes no. Ms. Harrington. No. Representative Healy. Yes. Okay. Uh, Ms. Mesmer. No. Okay. Representative Mooney. Yes. Okay. Uh, Ms. Murphy. No. Okay. Uh, Representative Wrong. Yeah, uh, no. Okay. And uh, Mr. Wimsat. I'm also going to abstain. Okay. That should be everyone. I'm just checking to make sure nobody. Oh, Mr. Ayat joined while I while my back was turned. Hello, Mr. Ayat. Welcome. Hello. Well, uh, thank you. And uh, I'll abstain. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Yes. Is that Hello? Senator Carson? Hi. Yes. Yeah, I had difficulty getting on this morning, and I will abstain also because I was not here when the question was called. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm all right. Multitasking. Let's go. Woo! Making sure everyone's uh, attendance is good. Okay. So by by my count, I believe that was four yes to the motion. Um, that there were also, I believe, uh, four abstentions. Um, are you keep Are you keeping track, Representative Rung? No, I was relying on you. <laughs> That's okay, Representative Mooney. I was keeping track to, as a somewhat, and according to my count, if it's helpful, I had four abstaining, seven no's, and four yeses. Okay, uh, can you confirm that, um, Ms. Take your time. It's Yeah, I, I, I believe the, the motion fails um, by that vote. Okay, so four yes, seven no's, four abstentions. Okay, uh, now uh, would you call the roll on the second nomination, which would be Representative Rung? Yes, so this is a um, motion for Representative Rung to continue as chair. Um, so I'm just gonna call everyone that's here uh, as it's a new motion. Uh, Mr. Ayotte. Yes. Mr. Bandazian. Yes. Representative Bohm. No. Dr. Bush. Abstain. Okay. Senator Carson. No. Okay. Uh, Representative Cretion. Yes. Okay. Senator Daniels. No. Okay. Um, the clerk, Ms. Forty, votes yes. Ms. Harrington. Yes. Representative Healy. No. Ms. Mesmer. Yes. Representative Mooney. No. Okay. Uh, Ms. Murphy. Yes. Okay. Uh, Representative Brung. Yes. And Mr. Wimsat. Abstain. Okay. Um, so I believe it's it's kind of the the reverse there with um so that would be three abstentions seven i believe it's three abstentions seven yes and five no does that sound i had eight yes but i guess yeah, eight yes okay sorry okay Okay, so um, the motion yeah. to have me continue as chair passes. Okay, thank you, everyone. We'll move on to the next agenda item, which is a presentation by uh, Mr. March of RBS about wealth sampling. Mr. Wimsett, I don't know if you would like to introduce Mr. March to the commission. 
Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. So Jeff Martz um, is here today to talk about, uh, as requested to provide a presentation on the status of the sampling program related to this project. And Jeff is our project manager for the St. Cobain site. Um, has been working for you know at least a couple of years. I, I, you, can, you can correct me on how long, Jeff, I'm losing track. Uh, not long enough as far as I'm concerned. He's a very capable hydrogeologist who is uh, just doing a terrific job managing this project and, and others. And uh, we're happy to have him here to uh, present on this. Jeff? Thanks, Mike. Mike, thanks, uh, members of the committee. It's a pleasure meeting you. Uh, some of you for the first time, others I've uh, met several times. Uh, as Mike said, um, I'm a senior hydrogeologist with the Hazardous Waste Remediation Bureau, the Emerging Contaminant Subsection. And I've been working on St. Cobain as the project manager since uh, the summer of 2018, so a little over two years. Uh, so I, I was asked to uh, present on the uh, update on the status of the Southern New Hampshire uh, PFAS sampling that's been going on. And um, starting out with a uh, map showing uh, the results for PFOA, uh, groundwater samples that were tested for PFOA, and those PFOA results are shown for statewide. Uh, throughout the remainder of my talk, I'm going to be showing results just for PFOA. And the reason for that is that PFOA is the primary PFAS that is driving ambient groundwater quality exceedances in the southern New Hampshire area. Uh, so for the most part, most wells are over the standard for PFOA when we have an exceedance. Um, there are occasional exceptions where uh, PFOS or some other compound may exceed, but by far the vast majority of exceedances are due to PFOA. Um, I, I use a similar looks color like, ramp. Looks like Kathleen yeah. has a question. <laughs> well, is, are, is anyone seeing a map? I'm sorry, I don't see a map. Is the map up on the screen? Uh, Jeff, I think we're seeing one of your other screens. We're seeing the launcher. Okay, uh, bear with me here. Thank you for that. Uh... Never sure if it's me, <laughs> so I wanted to ask. <laughs> Still just seeing see, the launcher. Uh, seeing the state of New Hampshire? Yep. Still just seeing the launcher though. There we go. There you go. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so let me just uh, start the slideshow here. Let's see. So we're still seeing the state of New Hampshire. I just got the slideshow going. Okay, so uh, this view shows uh, the results for PFOA for groundwater samples statewide. And throughout my talk, I use a similar color ramp. So the uh, green circles represent wells that have tested for PFOA between zero and six parts per trillion. Uh, so up to about 50% of the ambient groundwater quality standard or AGQS. Uh, circles that are red are over the standard of 12 parts per trillion, but below 70 parts per trillion, which is the previous standard. And the purple dots are over 70 parts per trillion. Uh, and then the yellow and orange dots are intermediate between uh, six parts per trillion and 12 parts per trillion. So just to give a little color. And the Southern New Hampshire area that I'm referring to is uh, within the uh, breakout box uh, that zooms in. And um, this area is unique in the state in that we have uh, hundreds to over thousands of wells that have been impacted by PFAS uh, in an area measuring tens of square miles. So, you know, looking across the state, there are detections of PFAS at individual sites, and we do have instances of groundwater contamination uh, of water supply wells, but nothing to the degree that we're seeing in Southern New Hampshire. So zooming in on that uh, box uh, in the, the Southern New Hampshire area, this slide shows uh, some known PFAS sites. Uh, the pink stars are individual uh, remediation sites that have tested groundwater in monitoring wells for PFAS, and it has been detected above ambient groundwater quality standards. Uh, as you can see, there are a number of them scattered throughout the area. And these are uh, what I would consider fairly discrete sites where they've had a release on site or releases on site and groundwater is contaminated. And in some cases, there may be offsite contamination, um, but they're fairly small in scale for the most part. And these types of sites range from uh, closed landfills to the Manchester airport where there's been a foam, foam releases uh, to uh, various commercial uh, establishments that may be using PFAS chemicals. Uh, and then we have the uh, St. Cobain consent decree area. St. Cobain is, uh, is known for an air release uh, from their facility through their smokestacks. 
And in 2018, DES and St. Cobain entered into a consent decree. As part of that consent decree uh, uh, agreement, there were two lines that were generated. The first is the uh, pre-GMZ line, which is shown in red on this map. And that line uh, encompassed most of the wells that tested above 70 part per trillion ambient groundwater quality standard that was in effect at the time in 2018. Uh, and then the second area is the uh, outer consent decree boundary, which is shown in blue. So that is the area that St. Cobain is responsible for ongoing sampling uh, due to the lowering of the AGQS to 12 parts per trillion per PFOA. So there are four main uh, sources of water supply well testing data that are coming in. Uh, there's a fifth that I didn't put on this slide because it's, it's a fairly small component. But uh, you know the primary ones are St. Cobain, which is doing sampling inside the consent decree. So they're responsible for evaluating the extent of AGQS violations resulting from discharges from their facility. Uh, this began uh, in 2019 when they submitted a work plan, which coincided with the lowering of the AGQS to 12 parts per trillion. Uh, since then, they have submitted seven <laughs> addenda to that work plan. And they provide biweekly and bimonthly uh, status reports uh, to DES that are available on the One Stop website. Uh, DES is conducting uh, sampling outside the consent decree. Currently, that sampling is focused in the town of Londonderry. Uh, they uh, started that sampling through uh, private well testing requests that have come in through our website. Uh, it's called SurveyMonkey. Uh, we refer to that internally as SurveyMonkey. And uh, currently the, the sampling is focused around uh, notification of uh, AGQS exceedances where properties surrounding an AGQS detection above uh, the standard, um, we buffer 500 feet around that and notify uh, property owners that that exceedance has occurred. And those uh, uh, abutting or uh, within that radius, landowners are encouraged to uh, sign up for testing on the SurveyMonkey uh, well testing request form. Uh, two other sources of uh, water supply well sampling that I'm not going to talk about in too much detail are uh, discrete sites. So those are the pink stars that I mentioned on the second slide. Most of that sampling is conducted by responsible parties uh, at the request of DES uh, as part of permits or ongoing sampling. And then there is uh, public water supply well testing that is conducted by the public water system operators. And the fifth uh, source of data is uh, uh, homeowners that choose to collect a water sample, submit it to a laboratory on their own, and then transmit the results to DES. So uh, just to review the air release pathway, since uh, that is the primary reason we're talking about so many wells that are uh, contaminated. Uh, so in the case of St. Cobain, they had a manufacturing facility that emits PFAS from their smokestacks. Uh, this has gone on for dating back in the 1980s when it was formerly ChemFab. And these chemicals are transported through the air with the wind currents uh, where they deposit on the ground as uh, either dry deposition or wet deposition when it's raining. And the PFAS go into the soil and uh, as rain leaches through the soil column, it moves the PFAS through the soil and eventually into uh, overburden aquifers or, or soil aquifers uh, and then on into the underlying fractured bedrock uh, where it could be captured by either a bedrock well or an overburden well, uh, the two types that we see uh, in the area. So uh, this slide shows the uh, consent decree boundary, the St. Cobain consent decree boundary in the dark blue line. And the underlying color map is uh, the two air models that DES did for TCI in 2019 and St. Cobain. So this is, represents the uh, total air deposition of uh, PFOA for the facilities that DES modeled. The warmer colors, the yellows, uh, represent the higher amounts of modeled uh, PFOA deposition. And the uh, purple and blues represent less deposition. I've also shown the uh, water supply well data that we have in GIS. This data is not comprehensive, so there are uh, more wells that are, are not shown. They're just not included in the database, but it gives you an idea of where water supply wells are located. And <clears throat> what I'd like to point out is that uh, nowhere in this modeled area is there uh, modeled to be zero deposition. And one thing I would like to point out to the board or to the commission is that uh, there are a lot of inherent uncertainties in the modeling. There are a lot of assumptions and, and unknowns that um, the modelers have to estimate or, or guess. And 
put into those models and, and they do lead to uh, different outputs. So I, I use this from a groundwater standpoint as a, as a guide in my investigation. Mr. Martz, can I ask you a quick question about that? Sure. So there doesn't appear to be much overlap between the two sources, the TCI and the St. Cobain source, based on your model, or is that an incorrect assumption? Um, I, I think that uh, there is overlap, and it's just at the the scale that I'm showing, it's difficult to see that. And this is a, a nonlinear color ramp, uh, meaning that uh, the uh, concentrations in the yellows and the air deposition that has occurred in the yellows is substantially higher than, say, the air deposition in the uh, blues and the uh, you know cooler or intermediate colors. If, if that helps. So I would say that I think there is degree of overlap between the air deposition that was modeled for TCI and St. Cobain. Any other questions on that before I move on? Yeah, Mr. Martz, I have a question. So the cooler colors, you're you're saying there's less air dis disposition, is that correct? That's correct. Um, but it seems as though that some of those wells have had exceedances of the uh, groundwater um, uh, quality standards. So I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I'm, I guess I'm trying to find if this modeling is predictive of contaminated wells. Can you explain that a little bit? Sure. I think I think I'll have another slide that uh, may illustrate that a little a little better. There there is a general correlation between some of the concentrations that we see. Yeah. For example, uh, in the yellow area around Saint Gobain, we tend to find that uh, wells that have been sampled in that yellow area, uh, in many cases, exceed 70 parts per trillion. So you'll see those on subsequent slides uh, within the pre-GMZ as uh, purple dots, so they, they do have a higher concentration in the groundwater. So I, I think there is a general predictive, uh, uh, there, there's some correlation, you know, you can't predict every single well because of some factors I'll talk about on the next slide, but uh, I, I think it is generally, uh, you can derive some level of prediction from the uh, air modeling. Uh, yeah, okay, I just read where those are from uh, GIS. So I, for some reason, I thought the black dots indicated uh, PFAS levels, but that's okay. Oh no, th no, those are just well locations. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, I got it. Thank you. Um, so let's see. If there are no other questions, I'll, I'll continue on. And at the end, I, we can circle back to any of these slides if we want to dive in in more detail, because um, I know I'm going through kind of quickly. So this this view, uh, the map view on the lower right, is uh, a distribution of PFOA in water supply wells. Uh, this ha screenshot happens to be from Bedford. And what we find is that there's a very complex spatial distribution of uh, PFAS. And what I mean by that complex spatial distribution is that you can have water supply wells that are uh, less than 50% of the AGQS, shown as green, uh, and even non-detect adjacent to a property with a well that exceeds AGQS. So it's this very complex map pattern. And some of the factors that go into, I think, contributing to this complex map pattern include differences in air deposition. Uh, so you may have um, high levels of deposition in some places, lower area, lower uh, total deposition in other areas. And I think the surficial, bedrock, the surficial geology plays an important role, both in terms of the types of sediment uh, and also the thickness of the sediment that, that plays a role in influencing the distribution of what we see in groundwater in the subsurface, uh, as well as the bedrock. Uh, I think there's some evidence that structural geology, major structures may influence and rock types may influence uh, concentration in some wells. But I think also on the individual neighborhood well uh, level, uh, I think depending on what fractures an individual well hits and how those fractures are connected to the overburden and the, the plumbing, if you will, of the uh, bedrock, uh, you know, I think plays a role in this complex pattern that we're seeing uh, in this view. And, and finally, time-related factors uh, also play a role. Uh, in, in, by time-related factors, I mean uh, changes in chemicals that have been released through time from the facility. So St. Cobain, for example, has changed their formulation uh, over time, and that changes you know, daily to hourly to some extent. And there was a major change in 2006 when they uh, largely phased out 
the uh, C8 compounds, it went to shorter chain C6 compounds. Um, so uh, you could imagine older groundwater may contain more uh, longer chain compounds relative to newer water or water that recharged into the aquifer a long time ago compared to water that recharged in the aquifer more recently. And finally, another uh, component to the variability is uh, seasonal variation. So, you know, there, I think there's emerging evidence that uh, as the seasons change and uh, the recharge of the aquifer uh, varies, I think there may be some differences in the concentration that we see. Uh, those of you who uh, heard my uh, talk uh, last July on the investigation probably saw this figure. And um, it, it's kind of a conceptual diagram uh, illustrating potential uh, release mechanisms and pathways uh, for PFAS to get into the subsurface. And I, I think it's also a, a good figure for a regional analogy. So, um, for example, the purple uh, blob, let's see if you can see my pointer, the purple blob here represents a discrete spill. And at the time in July, I was talking about spills at St. Cobain. But for my regional analogy, I think you can think of these discrete spills as the stars that I talked about in my second diagram. So individual sites that have had releases that have gone into the subsurface, and that might have one type of PFAS chemistry. Uh, and then we also have uh, air emissions uh, from St. Cobain, uh, potentially TCI, that uh, have a PFOA dominated uh, uh, pattern of PFAS. And you know that is spread or blanketed across the area at different degrees based on, you know some of the air modeling and whatnot. Um, so what you can have in some cases is a co-mingling of different sources of PFAS, and that some, makes it difficult in some cases to, to discern uh, one source from another, particularly as you get farther from the air emission sites. So moving on to the well sampling and uh, St. Cobain in particular in the consent decree. So they're, they're sampling uh, since 2019 in the consent decree area, and this slide shows uh, the sampling statistics from the St. Cobain uh, Residential Sampling Program. Uh, the older dates are on the left side of your screen, newer dates are on the right, and the uh, number of um, items being counted uh, goes up uh, with a maximum of 2,000 at the top of that graph. And uh, so far, St. Cobain has identified nearly 2,000 properties for sampling, and uh, they've also sent out nearly 2,000 uh, access agreements to those property owners to uh, request permission to sample. Um, and that's represented by the green and the blue lines, respectively. And right now, they've been finding a, a very good rate of return. They've gotten about 61% of uh, access agreements have been returned, and that's indicated by this uh, gold line here. So, you know, a little over half of the access agreements they send out get returned, and then they can schedule sampling. Uh, the number of wells sampled uh, to date numbers uh, just over 900. Uh, that's represented by this orange line. And the properties that are currently being offered bottled water are uh, illustrated by this gray line, and the current count is uh, 540 properties are, are being offered bottled water by St. Cobain. These uh, vertical lines, the thinner vertical lines, represent the addenda that are submitted to DES to the work plan, and they include the next round of properties uh, to be evaluated uh, in the sampling program. And I'll just point out there was a uh, you know several month gap uh, from the time that the uh, Superior Court judge enjoying the standards uh, last December uh, to when House Bill uh, 1264 was passed that uh, reinstituted those uh, standards. So, you know, that resulted in a delay of uh, the sampling project. So this is uh, one of the maps from uh, St. Cobain's most recent addenda. Uh, it's very complicated, but I'm, I'm gonna try and break it down uh, for the commission. Uh, the dark green color, uh, illustrates lots that St. Cobain's consultant has confirmed are connected to public water. Uh, so you can see there's quite a few lots within the consent decree area that are uh, connected to public water. Um, there are blue colored lots, solid blue. Those are fronting water lines and St. Cobain, I think, describes those as, uh, you know, likely, well, water's likely, but it has not yet been confirmed, so they could still have a well. Um, the brown lots have been identified for sampling. The blue hatched lots have been identified in this most recent addendum. So those are the most recent letters that have gone out to residents. And the pink colored lots are the lots that are, are currently being offered uh, bottled water to the residents. Uh, so those are uh, have AGQS exceedances on them. So we'll pull in out then the uh, white areas uh, represent lots that have not yet been brought into the sampling program or identified in one of the addenda. 
So this is zooming in on a portion of Bedford uh, to illustrate uh, more detail that, uh, that overall map. And one question I get from a lot of residents that call or why was my property selected for sampling? And there's, there's really three buckets that are bringing people into the sampling program. And uh, one of the, the first priority is proximity to an AGQS exceedance. So anybody that exceeds the AGQS, uh, St. Cobain's consultant buffers that property boundary by a 60 foot buffer. And any adjoining property that's clipped by that buffer is then included in the next sampling addenda. And uh, for example, the uh, color scheme uh, for PFOA is, is different on this map. This is a produced by Golder, and uh, PFOA that's over the standard is shown as uh, yellow, a yellow circle, or yellow triangle. The second uh, bucket is uh, what I would call quasi-random, and that includes uh, properties that are in areas where there's relatively low sample density, and uh, that is to try and capture uh, any new areas that have not yet been identified. And um, you know, I call it quasi-random because I you know some of the people that have been included in that bucket uh, have called the St. Cobain hotline and inquired about it being sampled. And the third bucket is uh, new relatively to uh, primarily addendum six and seven, and that includes neighborhood scale sampling where they've identified entire blocks for, uh, for, our, for sampling. Uh, stepping outside the consent decree over to Londonderry uh, where DES is doing sampling. Uh, so the sampling initially focused on uh, a number of well requests that had come in that were somewhat random scattered throughout the town. So it gave us a good overview of uh, you know, PFAS townwide. And from that, uh, current focus on sampling is on areas of uh, 500 foot notification buffer around AGQS succeeds. So you know, currently the uh, sampling is primarily focused within these uh, orange shaded areas on this map. Uh, stepping back out, the whole town of Londonderry, and just talking about uh, the DES sampling, just some quick statistics. Uh, in the last few months, DES has sent out over 1,200 notification letters to residents. Uh, as of earlier this week, there were 71 samples pending for analysis at uh, laboratory collected by our MTBE Bureau, and the Bureau had over 138 uh, appointments scheduled for additional samples to be collected. And uh, this map shows 675 groundwater samples uh, that have been collected outside the consent decree. So in the uh, eastern two thirds of London area, roughly. And uh, just as a note, this map does not include uh, public wells. So stepping back out to that regional uh, view, uh, this map shows water lines as blue, just so you get an idea of the water distribution system and uh, residential supply wells that have not been sampled and shown as these little black dots to the extent we have them. And then uh, you can see the uh, you know range of purple. So zooming in on the St. Cobain area, if you think back to that uh, air deposition figure, uh, we had the bright yellow generally in this area. And you can see that um, the majority of wells uh, range from purple in close, so over 70 parts per trillion, grading into some reds. And as you go, go further out, you get a mix of red grading into the green. So you know less than 50% of AGQS. So I, th I think there's some predictiveness to that uh, air deposition models, not inconsistent necessarily. Um, down in the lower left, we have uh, the area around TCI Amherst, uh, and you know we have other other discrete sites like the, the Merrimack landfill and looking out into uh, to Londonderry. I uh, just want to touch on uh, the little more on geologic factors uh, where we think the overburden plays a role. So if you look at the map on the right, uh, I'm going to change it in a second. But um, there's a very complex distribution here with wells that are you know, below 50% of the AGQS to over 70 parts per trillion. Uh, and when you drill in, I just changed that map. So now we have some triangles which represent overburden bedrock wells or overburden wells. So those are uh, screened in the soil, they're relatively shallow. And you can see that consistently those are all with the exception of one in this view are over standard, uh, in, including some that are over the 70 part per trillion standard. Whereas the bedrock wells, which are shown as little circles, are uniformly below standard. So I think what this is telling us is that this package of sediment here is acting to some extent as a shield and helping to protect the water quality uh, from the underlying fractured bedrock. So I, I think that's an important takeaway from the slide. Moving over into Londonderry, Londonderry is a little different in that they, uh, compared to the other towns involved uh, that I've talked about, Litchfield, uh, Bedford, Merrimack, they have uh, less, uh, or 
it probably in terms of uh, square square mile area, they have less uh, glacial outwash and alluvial deposits, so they're they're more dominated or I characterize them as primarily dominated by till or shallow till or shallow shallow bedrock. And what we find is that uh, in areas that I've colored red here, you tend to see in the topography, this is LIDAR topography, a rough texture to the topography, which I would interpret to suggest that uh, there's very little sediment over the rock and rock is close to the surface. And we find that the uh, wells generally in that area tend to exceed standard for uh, AGQS or PFOA. Whereas if you look in the area I've shaded here in uh, sort of a yellow tan, um, you notice that the character of the topography as represented by LIDAR uh, tends to be uh, smoother and in some cases even fluted. So kind of a drawn out linear feature going from the upper left to the lower right. And uh, what I think we are looking at is a, a till deposit that was emplaced at the bottom of the last uh, glacier that slid over and that that fluted texture represents ice flow direction. So I think similar to the previous slide, where the alluvial deposits seem to impart some protection in the underlying bedrock, I think this uh, basal till or thicker till layer, uh, you know, appears to impart to some extent uh, some protection to the underlying uh, bedrock wells. Um, looking at the temporal variability of peat bass, I uh, talked about that a little bit in the beginning. Um, we, we don't have a, a big data set for residential water supply wells, but there are nine wells that have been sampled by DES and St. Cobain uh, going back to 2016. And I looked at these nine wells because they've been sampled four or more times through time. And I wanted to get a sense of what the temporal or seasonal changes might be, if any. So I plotted the highest sample from each well and the lowest sample from each well. The high samples are colored blue, the low samples are colored red. Um, and when I looked at the months or the uh, quarter, like it, there wasn't a clear pattern. So I, I wanted to drill in a little deeper to what was going on in terms of the uh, hydraulic state of the bedrock. And I, I looked at, um, I got some water level data from a USGS well that's monitored in Pembroke. And I used that as a proxy for uh, climatic conditions and uh, the hydrologic state of the bedrock, whether it was the water levels were increasing or decreasing. And what stood out was that seven of the nine low PFOA sampling events tended to occur on uh, recessional limbs when the, the water level in the bedrock well was decreasing or near the uh, bottom of an inflection point just before uh, recharge events uh, began. Uh, so again, seven of the nine samples for low PFOA tended to occur uh, during drier times when less recharge was making its way into the bedrock aquifer. Uh, so those wells uh, that I looked at were from Bedford and Merrimack. And I have one example of a well that I, I uh, happened to notice was sampled twice by our MTBE Bureau and had a, a fairly noticeable difference in PFOA. And when I plotted that against the uh, bedrock well in Pembroke, um, the first lower sample uh, of PFOA came back at just under 30, uh, occurred before the inflection when recharge started to happen. And the sample collected after recharge began uh, came back at uh, 49 parts per trillion. So I know I've covered a lot of information here, uh, and I guess with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to the uh, committee if, if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Mars. There's a lot of data here, and uh, I want to ask your permission if we can post this to our commission website. Uh, sure. I, yeah, I could provide a PDF uh, to the commission. Uh, I, I think my previous one was posted. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll take any questions. Do any commission members have questions? Ms. Harrington. Make sure I'm on mute first. Uh, Mr. Moss, just a quick question. Are you involved with acquiring the access agreements for the different private wells? So uh, Golder is Golder is uh, St. Cobain's consultant, for those of you who are not aware. So Golder is an environmental consulting company that uh, you know is doing this work that DES requested on behalf of St. Cobain. And they are the ones that uh, secure the access agreements. Uh, so they send those out. DES actually doesn't require access agreements. That's uh, something that most consulting companies, you know, won't go on somebody's property without without having an agreement in place. Well, maybe you can help guide me. The last three or four meetings, we had become aware that there were Merrimack residents who had not responded to the request for access agreements. And I had offered the town's assistance in trying to get, you know, to encourage them to do that. 
And we have not, to the best of my ability, even though I've requested it, the town has not received a list of those names in order for us to contact them and encourage them. Who should, so we, yes, Mr. Wimsatt wants to answer that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate the question. I wanted to let you know in my update, I'm gonna be talking about that. We've got a draft letter for the towns to use as a template if they would like for sending that out. We have a list of the properties and we're gonna be working with Gold or the uh, consultant for St. Cobain to get the actual mailing addresses. So I think within the next week or so, we should have a package for each town that wants to do that of, of the four towns. Perfect, thank you very much. That answers my question. Okay, are there any other questions? Uh, yes, Dr. Bush. Hi, thanks. That was really a lot of data and super interesting and also very complicated. Um, so I'm trying to kind of process it all. And I, from a public health perspective, I just want to put out there and sort of plant a seed that the finding about the well type is super interesting, right? And if there is an opportunity to be providing guidance when people are drilling wells in a way where we think we can reduce or perhaps eliminate exposure, we need to really pay attention to that data. And we need to think about how to implement public health interventions that take advantage of that finding. So I know that maybe some of this is kind of preliminary, it's only so many points, but it's something that Joe Ayat and I have talked about before in terms of public health intervention. If we can eliminate exposures from the water through technology and our well design, we need to pay attention to that point and really think about how we design policy that guides that. Very good point, thank you. Representative Cretion. Oh, you're muted. Uh, oh, there you go. Thank you. Um, thanks, I, I think you might have answered this a little bit in your very last slide, but um, going back to, oh, I wish I had written down the number. Um, going back to the point that you had made kind of midway in about um, there being seasonal variation in uh, the levels and, and depending on recharge. Um, have you looked at patterns in the numbers like based on the sampling time? And is that something that we could potentially, uh, or that residents could maybe potentially use as knowing like, or sorry, being able to kind of mitigate their own risks, like saying, oh, in general, maybe I want to avoid the water in the spring a little bit more than in the winter, or is it much more complicated than that? You know, I, I guess I would caution you in that, you know, we only are looking at, uh, I guess, 10 wells, you know, the nine from Bedrock, uh, from uh, Bedford and Merrimack and one from Londonderry. So it, it's a, a pretty small sample set. And, you know, I think there was one that actually is from Merrimack that uh, I didn't point out on that chart, but it's uh, a well near Wildcat Falls. And I looking at air photos it looks like uh the uh there's a river that goes over uh some big outcrops and i think that well uh had low pfoa during the springtime and so presumably when the river stage was high you might have had more induced recharge from the river potentially diluting pfoa so it, it's probably not quite as simple as that but you know i think we're using this data to inform you know um ongoing monitoring and uh you know the type of frequency and schedule that we'd be considering. So that, that's how I'm starting to, you know, think about this data set. Um, great, thing. Any other questions? Uh, yes, Ms. Mesmer. I have two questions. Um, this was a great presentation. Thank you for doing it. Um, the first question is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it appears that the consent decree area has a greater than, or a 60 foot buffer around exceedances of AGQS, uh, whereas outside the consent decree area, you said 500 feet. Um, can you describe to us why that differs in the 60 foot envelope seems very small to me when you compare that to all the sorts of things we look at to protect, uh, you know, wellhead protection area, things like that. But it seems like that that is a very small buffer area, which could impact, you know, whether or not we're actually finding people who are drinking water that's above the standards is that am i correct in that what i saw from that yeah that that's correct so uh golder associates as part of their work plan came up with a 60-foot uh, buffer to guide uh, subsequent addenda that they submit uh, on an ongoing basis 
and that that's to really kind of home in on this uh, geospatial concept of the like the nearest neighbor tends to have a neighboring well tends to have a concentration similar to their adjoining neighbor. Although you know I've shown many examples where that's not necessarily specifically true. Um, so that that's specific to the Saint-Cobain work plan for going through the the water supply well sampling. The 500 foot buffer is uh, like a statutory uh, requirement on DES to provide notification. Um, and that applies statewide uh, for exceedance of uh, AGQS, and it's not not particular to PFAS. It, it would apply to any contaminant um, that exceeds an ambient groundwater quality standard. Um, but I, I think that um, you know the 60 foot offset uh, being said, it doesn't mean that they're not going to sample uh, in between there, because I think uh, the sampling to date shows that you know you can't predict what an individual well is going to test at until you actually test it. Um, you know, I think there's some probability that you know any well in this area could could test uh, above standard. It's just that probability changes depending on uh, where you are within the consent decree. So, uh, you know, just because you're not touched by a 60 foot offset doesn't mean eventually that the uh, sampling program isn't going to include those lots. So, to follow up to that, so you mentioned the 500 foot NHDES. Um, requirement to notify is that superseded by the 60 foot or are those people within the consent decree area also getting a 500 foot notification from the state no the, uh, it was decided that the uh, people within the consent decree are not uh, currently getting that 500 foot uh, notification that is occurring outside the consent decree why is that uh, Mike, do you have any uh, background on that? I know that was in place before I came on board with the project. Yeah, I think the idea behind it, the notification requirements to make people aware that they might be located near a well that's above standards. Um, and so we've had multiple notifications of people within the consent decree area over time. And just from a practical standpoint, because of the density of sampling that's going on, if you do notifications, Every time you get it in a exceedance of the AGQS within 500 feet, many people would be getting multiple notifications because of just the overlap of these areas. So obviously we're working to get this whole area inside the consent decree sampled as promptly as possible. And then um, we're trying to prioritize that sampling based on where we see the um, where they see the exceedances, which is what Jeff has been describing that the, the gold is doing. And then the, the expectation is that we will get all of these wells sampled. And then for those that are above standards, get them all to know water. Okay. I, I guess I don't understand then. I mean, they could get one letter that says, you know, it says it seems to be converse to what you would want to do. The people in the consent decree area should know and be notified more so than the people not that not that the people in London area shouldn't but it would seem to me that you know you should apply that within the consent decree area as well so I don't understand why that's happening but um, I've highlighted that for the rest of the commission members to chew on a little bit the second question I have is um, with respect to the seasonal variation Jeff that you pointed out in those wells to me that kind of says that you know the recharge is happening from the overburden to the bedrock wells um, seasonally so um, you would expect them to be more diluted in the spring, but actually the water level is higher. So that tells me there's a lot of contribution from the overburden coming into those wells. Is that how, and is that borne out by um, a, a comparison of the um, vertical flow in those between the bedrock and overburden in the area? So, you know, unfortunately we don't have a like downhole geophysics, like it'd be great to have downhole geophysics to characterize exactly what's going on in some of these wells, but that's kind of a really complex time consuming uh, data point to gather. Um, so right now it's a working hypothesis that, you know, because there's, uh, you know, recharge of PFAS predominantly from the overburden into the underlying bedrock that, you know, I would agree with that, that statement that, you know, um, that the, that the overburden is recharging the underlying bedrock and that's that's where the PFAS is. So, you know, working hypothesis might be that a deeper, older fracture, you know, would uh, tend to have cleaner water with respect to PFAS. Um, unfortunately, I don't have ages of individual uh, water bearing zones in some of the rock wells, but I think some of the work that's gone on in Vermont where they have done some uh, more detailed studies on an individual well basis, 
uh, you know, I think the impression, at least as of a year ago, when I was talking to my colleagues over there, was that, you know, shallow fractures and, and shallow bedrock tended to be more contaminated than the, the deeper fractures. But I will caveat that, that they have a uh, thrust fault package uh, over there where there's uh, a higher degree of compartmentalization of the bedrock aquifer, which is different than what we have here. Are there any plans in the following site investigation work for St. Cobain to have clustered wells installed to evaluate that so we can know whether or not the well construction, as uh, Kathy Bush, Katie Bush mentioned, is an issue? So we do have a, a number of clustered wells on the, the St. Cobain facility uh, property. And I, th I think one telling point is very interesting is uh, the triplet, well triplet that has both the highest concentration of PFAS. So, I, you know, we've talked about one that measures close to 70,000 parts per trillion in the shallow uh, overburden well that's maybe on the order of 15 feet deep uh, is immediately adjacent to a bedrock well that has the lowest concentration, which I think is less than five parts per trillion PFOA. So they are immediately adjacent to each other. And there is a huge vertical concentration gradient at that particular point at the facility. Uh, so basically going from four parts per trillion or, or few parts per trillion up to 70,000 parts per trillion as you move um, maybe 100 plus feet vertically in the aquifer. So uh, we do have some information on that. Okay, thank you. Hey, Jeff. Um, how much is known about the individual wells themselves in terms of well depths, casing lengths, um, anything like that that should be publicly available? Have you guys looked at that as a whole um, to evaluate any potential relations? Yes, uh, good question. So some of the early data that DES uh, collected um, was somehow merged with well construction information where available. So um, we have maybe uh, 150 or a few hundred uh, well results for PFAS that uh, compare with uh, the well construction records. Um, another thing that I think is came out of that, looking at those data and plotting uh, PFOA as a function of say well uh, casing length and overburden uh, thickness, uh, there appeared to be a relationship of um, you know lower PFOA, the longer your casing and the uh, thicker the overburden. Okay, yeah, we did. So um, just to follow up a little bit on Katie's comment too, on uh, you know interventions. So we've, it's, it's always hard to tease out relations with depth on bedrock wells because you don't really know where the fractures are unless you've done detailed investigations as you alluded to. However, when you evaluate a big group of wells and we've done this for nitrate and for arsenic, you know, wells that were less than 300 feet deep with shorter than 20 feet of casing tended to have higher concentrations of nitrate than wells that were greater than 300 feet deep with more than 20 feet of casing and, and everything in between. So we could ferret out some useful potentially relations that um, uh, from those kinds of data. The other thing that occurred, which may occur for uh, PFAS as well is, and I believe we've talked about this, um, differences by rock type. Um, may be important. Um, some rocks may contaminate uh, and decontaminate at different rates than other rock types where you have wells installed. And then the other one that's, that was sort of an oddball finding was that concentrations in bedrock wells for MTBE in Rockingham County, with at least one set of data that we looked at, were higher in the deeper wells. And that was sort of an oddball thing to find. You know, why would that be? Um, but when we looked at it a little deeper, it turned out that those deep wells also were the lowest yielding wells um, under the idea that you drill deeper if you have if you don't have enough water um, when you're installing wells. And so deep wells was a surrogate for low yield, which was a sort of a surrogate for low dilution or low ability to move contaminants away once they get in. Um, so all of, I think all of those things would probably be um, very complexly important uh, in evaluating this kind of thing. But but back to interventions, if if any of that could be ferreted out, it's possible that well casings could be lengthened or um, other well installation or well uh, well repair methods could be used to 
um, shut off the upper parts of the bedrock well and make water only accessible for the deeper parts and wells that can handle it. And so there may be some there may be some relatively easy things to do that would reduce exposure uh, to get at what Katie was mentioning, uh, but it would probably require, you know, of course, a little uh, study of that before people got too carried away. Yeah, thanks, Joe. I, I think there were, were great comments. One of the slides I had to cut out, just to trying to keep it short, was uh, a slide showing the Gove member of the Berwick Formation, and I think yeah. the wells. I, I think I showed you a, a, maybe something offline on that, um, but right. that Gove tended to have lower concentrations uh, relative to the surrounding uh, portions of the Berwick Formation. So it's, I think spot on there. Mindy, okay. do you have a question? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so getting back to my initial question about the air deposition model that you showed, um, do you have a do you have any idea yet on, you know, it's complicated because what Joe was talking about has to do with principally groundwater flow migration issues, whereas this is a combination of both air deposition of the contaminants and migration of groundwater that's contaminated. Um, so do you have a feel for how far <clears throat> the plume extends and how it overlaps with this? I mean, it, it must be very complicated to figure out they're sort of all like point sources, right? After the, the air deposition happens, then it continues to contribute to the flow uh, in the groundwater. So it's just, it's kind of boggling. <laughs> it boggles your mind to try and figure out exactly how the stuff's getting there and how to protect people from it. Um, but do you have a feel for that kind of a thing? Are you guys looking at, you know, the contribution of air versus the contribution of groundwater flow? Uh, that's contaminated. Yeah, that that's actually a really good good question. Um, you know, of course, under the uh, facility itself, uh, the concentrations that are measured in groundwater are often in the thousands of parts per trillion for PFOA. And I, I think, um, you know, the the really high thousands to you know over ten thousand is is probably localized primarily to the facility. Maybe stepping out a little bit, you're you're about a thousand in some of the residential supply wells that were that were previously in operation immediately around the facility. Uh, and then it quickly drops off into the, the hundreds of parts per trillion. And I think that's a function of the uh, nonlinear air deposition. So really high concentrations being deposited right around the facility and dropping off. So I think like, you know, that that plume uh, discharges probably primarily to Dumpling Brook and to a lesser extent uh, to the Merrimack River. Um, so I think the, the plume from the facility and any discrete releases that may have occurred there is is fairly limited. Uh, I did take a look at the um, aquifer maps uh, around the consent decree boundary and tried to just have a, in a general sense evaluate, you know, is there a lot of groundwater flowing out of the consent decree boundary? And uh, for the most part, I, coming away from that analysis, I would say in general, there's not a lot of groundwater flowing out uh, in terms of big superficial aquifers. Uh, and I think that's largely because the, the facility is on the Merrimack River, so things are, are generally drenched. Uh, draining towards the Merrimack River in, in a very general sense. Um, so I don't think there's like plumes, massive plumes of groundwater moving out of the consent decree. I think most of the exceedances that we are seeing are, are probably more likely related to, and this is a technical opinion, more likely related to, uh, you know, the aerial deposition uh, around an immediate area around the well. Okay, are there any other questions? Uh, Mr. Bedazian. Um, thank you, Jeff, for your, your presentation. There's great uh, breadth and, and depth to it. Um, first questions are about the monitoring wells. Are those the same as the discrete sites or public drinking water wells, or are they in addition to uh, those wells when you're looking at temporal variability? Uh, so the ones that I, I uh, showed in this uh, slide, those were uh, strictly residential water supply wells, uh, and specifically bedrock residential water supply wells. Uh, the temporal variability in uh, monitoring wells, I, I didn't discuss, but um, there are there is a data set, a growing data set that's fairly robust, uh, quarterly samples from the St. Cobain facility, uh, both bedrock and overburden. So we, we do have a data set, but I didn't present any of those data today. And is that data available online for commission members or the public to look at? That is, uh, St. Cobain's consultant does submit uh, annual groundwater reports and uh, 
that would probably be the best place to look because I, I think they tend to uh, put graphs together so you can see the changes through time for each of their monitoring wells. So I, I'd probably steer you to uh, the annual groundwater monitoring reports. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and my other question is, is um, on the sampling patterns you mentioned most recently um, that neighborhoods are being added uh, for sampling. How are the neighborhoods selected? Uh, I think looking at the map, you know, I haven't gotten too into the weeds on how they are sampling it. Uh, you know, that's something coming from Golder, but I think their uh, uh, identification in neighborhoods is driven largely by proximity to, uh, you know, bulk AGQS exceedances. So a lot of lots that are exceeding AGQS at a high frequency. I think that's driving it. And, um, you know, I think in part it may be uh, to aid in their determination on how they're going to proceed with, uh, you know, remediation of these wells. Uh, you know, I think it'll aid in the decision making as they get more data, you know, um, how they're going to play out and correct the situation that we're finding. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Um, I, I have one. Um, I actually I had a few, but they were out, already asked and answered. But the one remaining is, I know that USGS and DES were partnering on a soil sampling study um, this fall and into next year. And I wonder if there's been any learnings from that that we can apply to some of this understanding the, um, the, the, the concentration of PFAS in wells. Um, you know, I don't know, Jeff, are you are you aware of any of that data? Yeah, we're uh, just very in the early stages of collecting that that data. And I don't know, Joe, has any of the PFAS data actually even come back from the lab for the handful of samples collected so far? Not quite yet. We expect it soon. Yeah, because one of my, the things that I wonder is whether we can be predictive of PFAS concentration in wells based on the loading in soil that we could predict, okay, there's going to be so much leaching left to do. Um, it might also get back to Dr. Bush's suggestion that this might drive some of the decision-making regarding uh, well construction and where we put them in. We know there's going to be some soil load, there's soil loading of PFAS um, that would then uh, leach into the groundwater that would be servicing that well, that it, it may influence a decision on, on whether even to construct that well or not. So I, I just was wondering how far that project is. Okay. Um, Saint Germain has uh, collected, uh, you know, hundreds of uh, soil samples, uh, you know, in in the area, um, mainly within the pre-GMZ. So they they do have a lot of data, and in general, where you see really high soil concentrations, you see really high groundwater concentrations. But you know, I think I think the challenge is going to be as you get into uh, far-flung areas where you know, you have uh, exceedances at the 12, 13, up to 20 parts per trillion range. Uh, you know, the question becomes, can you detect it in the soil at a concentration that would leach? And, uh, you know, would that inform what the groundwater is? And I, I think that's an open question because I've certainly seen uh, some soil data that was non-detect, which is, you know, the detection limit was around a part per billion in soil, but we do have exceedances of the 12 part per trillion standard in water. So I, I think that might be a challenge in some of the low concentration areas. Okay. Thank you. Uh, seeing no other uh, questions, we'll move on. Uh, Ms. Martz, thank you very much. This was a great presentation. I look forward to the PDF to make sure that we communicate that out to our communities. Thank you thank very much. Thank you very much. much. Appreciate it. Good, good science. Thanks. Um, moving on, uh, this wasn't in the draft agenda, but I'd like to add it um, today. It's an update by uh, Councillor Harrington on, uh, from the town of Merrimack. Councillor Harrington, I'll pass it on to you. Hi, thank you. I even have breaking news as we're meeting, <laughs> but I'll get to that in a moment. Okay, very quickly, I'm gonna to try to do this really quickly because I know people are time sensitive. Just wanted to update you on the concrete pad problem that we had with a building permit here in Merrimack. Uh, first of all, St. Cobain is giving that as a reason for the delay of the installation of the RTO, which is a whole different issue, but anyway. Uh, the town has met with St. Cobain and they have developed a plan for the development of the concrete pad and all the other requirements. So that is in process and that was basically submitted to us officially on February 27th. Remember prior to that time it was a three-page scratchy 
very simple and simplistic, um, unacceptable application. So on the 27th, what was needed and what they had been uh, instructed to do was finally submitted. So they're working on that now. Uh, okay, just to let you update you on the town legal activities. As you probably know, on February 22nd, the town filed a lawsuit for injunctive relief, naming DES and St. Cobain, they're both listed. And this basically has to do with controlling the admissions immediately in that they could not do that to close down. Uh, similarly, DES also filed uh, a lawsuit for injunctive relief with St. Cobain. On March 4th, and we have not heard anything from St. Cobain related to that, but there are things going on with DES. On March 4th, the town did file a cease and desist order following up the injunctive relief suit because we have not heard anything. And yesterday, we filed a temporary restraining order to basically stop causing continual harm to Merriman. Again, we're just trying to get some movement. Um, hot off the press. Um, DES and St. Cobain are having a court hearing on Monday. And we are able to listen. And I have information that if you want to call and listen to the proceedings. So everybody get their pens ready. Uh, in order to listen to the uh, hearing, the phone number is 603-766-5646. And the ID number that you'll have to plug in is 270-19490. Do you want me to repeat that? The ID number is 270-1949. What time is that hearing, Representative? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, okay. oh, gee, that's a really legitimate question. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'm going to, I, I'm texting back and forth with the town. I'll get that information to make sure that it's provided to this commission before we hang out. Okay, the only thanks. other thing I want to be able to tell you is that I'm going to be testifying in front of the Air uh, Resource Council, and that's going to be on April 5th, 6th, and 12th. I'm going to be testifying on the 5th. Uh, and that has to do with our request to uh, put in a buffer for the hydrogen fluoride uh, toxic potential toxic emissions. Okay. In fact, you know, it's funny, someone just texted, what time? Because they had not been submitted, so I might have the answer in a moment. Okay, thank you very much. Ms. Mesmer, do you have a question? I was just hoping to the extent possible, um, perhaps um, Ms. Harrington could provide us copies of the court filings um, that she referenced, the recent ones. I think that if they're public records, so there's probably no reason I can't share that. Now, are you talking about all of them, the injunction, the cease and desist, all that, Mindy? I have the initial filing that you all sent, but the, oh, the follow-up, the two follow-ups would be great. Okay, the uh, hearing is at 9 a.m. on mm -hmm. Monday. Okay, thank you. Texting is great, isn't it? Representative Baum, did you have a question? I, thought, I saw your hand move. No, okay. Any other? Uh, yes, Ms. Forty. Hi, thank you. Um, is this so the public can listen to this court hearing? Um, I'm just thinking of because I'd, I'd like to, you know, publicize it in case people are interested. Um, so it's a hearing between DES and and Saint Cobain. Court hearing, court hearing with DES and Saint Cobain, probably related to the injunctive release that they have filed. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Harrington. I appreciate that update. Um, next on the agenda is the uh, review of interim report recommendations. I do have some updates, and I will update the, the, the table and get it out to you. Um, we have some good news. Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Bohm. Oh, I think you're muted, sir. 
yeah, we can't we can't hear you. Okay. Oh, okay. Now can you? Okay. Like there's two buttons. Anyway, yeah, I have to leave now. So. Oh, okay. You know. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, so HB 256, which was the bill to add a legendary representatives passed unanimously in the resources committee and it passed in the house. So I know Senator Daniels said he'd keep his eye out. Uh, it has been assigned to the Senate committee, but I don't believe that hearing has been scheduled yet. Um, also HB 271, which was uh, updating the nomenclature of PFCs to PFAS. Um, also passed uh, the, the committee unanimously, and it's awaiting the House vote. I expect that to happen in early April. It, it will be on the consent agenda. Um, we also had the uh, HB 236 to extend the statute of limitations on chemical and PFAS-related injury. That was a bill sponsored by Representative Mooney and Representative Healy um, that passed the Judiciary Committee 11 to 10. They, they had a few close votes on some bills which also include HB 368, um, which requires any source company responsible for water and soil contamination to be responsible for the cost of medical monitoring over a long-term basis for those exposed. Um, and also HB 135, uh, that was uh, Representative Bohm's bill. Uh, and I think uh, I, there were a few other reps on it. I know Representative Nader was also on that bill. Um, that would be requiring parties responsible for pollution of drinking water to be financially responsible for certain consequences of that. And then I just got an update from Representative Mooney this morning on HB 478. That's the bill that would require St. Cobain to continue re cost of remediation past the settlement agreement with F uh, MBD. Um, that was retained by the committee 20 to 1. So I'll update that table and, and send it out to all of you. Um, and if you have any other updates to what those, uh, the recommendations for our interim study were, let me know. Uh, yes, Representative Mooney. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just on that subject, I'd like to thank those on the commission who signed in in favor of these bills and testified. For example, on House Bill 478, there were 145 members of the public signing in in favor of the bill, only three opposed. While I'm on the topic of 478, yes, that was retained. And I'm hoping that this commission can make it a top priority to stay on that bill, assist the Judiciary Committee in whatever questions they have. There was only one speaker during the exec session who discussed the fact that they were unclear as to a court versus legislature as the proper venue for this. So I'm hoping this commission can truly help with that initiative and we can have a great recommendation in 2022 on House Bill 478. One more thing, uh, I, I'm glad you mentioned these bills because it's so important uh, that we have the updates and I know with the scheduling and so forth, some of these hearings come up awfully quick. Uh, you could check the docket in the morning and you know it's different in the afternoon. Uh, I certainly don't mind sending out notices as I discover these things to the full commission, but if there's another uh, means by which to do that so that we can know when to sign or in or testify, uh, perhaps we could have that discussion. I think that would be extremely helpful, Representative Booney, and thank you very much for that offer. I think we would all appreciate it. Um, I know those of us that are in the general court, we are bombarded with email and uh, you know, requests for signing in and things like that. So knowing if you could be the point person for PFAS related bills, that would be great. Um, because, you know, we put this list together and I, like you, I try to keep up with the docket, but it is, it's very difficult to manage it. Um, and especially with this remote environment where um, meetings could, an exec session could be the same day. Uh, it's very difficult to know, uh, those don't get noticed. Uh, specifically as public hearings do. Okay, uh, yes, there? Daniels. Uh, this is Senator Carson. Oh. There, uh, There is a bill in the Senate concerning PFAS. It's, it is a bill that I filed. Mm -hmm. It is Senate Bill 111, and it is being heard in Gen Senate Judiciary this week, and it has to do with medical monitoring for PFAS exposure. Okay. 
All right, that that would be great. Um, Representative Mooney, do you want to do you want to take the ball on se sending out standard emails to the commission? Um, you know, requesting, you know, like having the link for the sign in. Um, yes, I'd be glad to do that. And I think I have everybody's email address. Uh, I think perhaps Mr. Bandazian, I don't know if your address, if, if it works for me, but I'll look into finding a new one for you. Have you received an email from me prior? Um, I don't recall, but I will check. Okay. okay. Yeah, there are two emails which I need to change on my distribution. One is Mr. Bandazian. Um, I don't believe your Bedford, town of Bedford email works anymore. There's another one, New Hampshire. Yeah. Attorney. Um, yes. And then um, uh, Ms. Murphy, um, sometimes her, legis her old legislative email gets, gets caught up in some of these distributions, but I'll make sure you have those two. I also want to add the assistance to Senator Daniels and Senator Carson on these emails so that they can be flagged on any notices as well. So um, I know it just kind of came up today with Ms. Russo, but um, you know what I'll do, Representative Mooney, I'll send you the complete email list, then you could just, you know, copy and paste it into your fields. That'd be and great, I'll, I'd be glad to do that. Okay, yeah, because I did send out the roster, um, I think a couple meetings ago, which has all of the updated, uh, oh no, there, there are a couple email changes. So I'll update this, yeah, it was last updated uh, February 14th, so let me let me update this and send it out. Okay, I'll do that. I'll do that after the meeting. Senator Daniels. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I didn't catch the status on House Bill 368 and 135. Uh, 368, that was uh, judiciary. That was one of those ought to pass uh, 10 to 11 votes. And okay. I'm sorry, what was the second bill you had? Uh, 135. 135 is, um, that was also judiciary uh, 11 to 10. Okay, thank you. Okay, no problem. I'll, I'll get, I'll update this too. Um, all right, uh, any other questions before we move forward on the agenda? Okay. Um, okay, the next item is uh, public meeting scheduling. Um, I'm very, very happy to report that um, Amy Russo at DES is kindly offered to host a subcommittee meetings. Um, I had gotten clarification from the clerk that we have to have those meetings uh, noticed. And uh, so they've, Amy's done that, offered to do that. I'm just eternally grateful. So I'd like to ask um, the uh, chairman of those subcommittees, I believe uh, Ms. Mesmer, might've been Ms. Murphy and Mr. Bendazian, I'm not quite sure. And then Ms. Forty, We'll get to you or, or Miss Paradise about communications. Um, I'd like to ask each of you to schedule your subcommittee meetings sometime this month so that we can have a, uh, a an update at our next commission meeting. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then moving on, um, uh, DES, Mr. Wimsat, let's have an update from from DES. Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I know we're, we're running running close here, so but I, I think I can make my uh, update pretty brief. First of all, um, in response again to, as I mentioned earlier, in response to uh, Council Harrington's question, um, we do have a draft uh, sort of template letter for the towns to use to uh, try to reach out to the folks who've been, who've received invitations to sample, but who have not responded. We still need to track down a, a, a spreadsheet of the mailing addresses. We have the the names and the addresses, but they're their locational addresses. So we just need to get that uh, mailing address information, and I will be sharing that with uh, leadership in the four towns um, as soon as we have that information. I hope we can do that this coming week. Um, and as you indicated, Madam Chair, um, we are prepared to host these the remote meetings of the subcommittees, and uh, we certainly encourage those subcommittee chairs to coordinate scheduling, as you indicated, with, with Amy Rousseau. And we're very thankful for Amy for, for uh, offering to do this. And uh, I'd also like to work with the communications subcommittee to schedule some public meetings in each of the towns. Um, so if they do pull together a meeting 
Um, I'd like to, to, to be on the agenda for that so we could talk about pulling together some public meetings to do some outreach and, and share some information and field questions from, from the residents. So I think that's something that's important to do in the, you know, to definitely do this spring and, and get that going as soon as possible. Cause I know there's a tremendous amount of interest in the communities and we haven't had those kinds of meetings for some time. Um, going on to uh, the, the sort of general format that I use for my updates. Uh, obviously I usually speak a little bit about the status of the, of the permit and the installation of the uh, thermal oxidizer. Um, given the considerable legal actions, which uh, Councilor Harrington uh, described um, between uh, the parties, between uh, St. Cobain, the town of Merrimack and, and the and DES, I'm not gonna make any remarks about that topic today because it's just too, <laughs> it's a little too current, I guess. And we'll know a lot more, I think, uh, at the next meeting. So we'll look forward to maybe being able to review that at the next meeting. Um, and I, you know, again, some of this, I, I, I try to review some of this each time because I think it's helpful, but there are parts of my, you know, update that are, that are things that I've provided at the previous meeting, as I think everyone knows, and, and Jeff, I can, I can say a lot less this time because Jeff has just given you a really terrific summary of a lot of this work, um, but we do have the supplemental site investigation report that's still um, in review and uh, we it, it includes uh, preliminary screening of potential remedial alternatives. And uh, once we complete our review of that, um, we'll be you know, providing a detailed comment letter to St. Cobain. Um, they also submitted a work plan in January for additional stormwater sampling. And uh, the idea is that that would be conducted after the, the oxidizer is operational. So if things go well and that happens, um, and they get this thing up and running, then we would expect that work to be conducted in late summer, or early fall. Um, there's been no change in the flatly development. Uh, as far as I know, that has still been voluntarily pulled. Their application for, for uh, local site plan approval has been put on hold. And I don't, as far as I know, that has not changed uh, for the adjoining property zoned by flatly. Um, no change on the water line. We're still waiting for a uh, remedial implementation report for the work that was already been done to implement the, uh, the water line installations, primarily in Litchfield. Um, on the water supply well sampling, Jeff just reviewed that in detail, so I, I won't do that here. I will note, however, that I usually let you know that, um, uh, that how many properties have not been sampled yet based on our St. Cobain's assessment of that an estimate of that. And they, in the past, I think it, as recently as the last meeting, I said there were 2,600 properties that they estimated um, for, that uh, were, were not yet uh, um, not yet sampled. And actually that number's been adjusted because when they were reporting that to us, it did not include the folks who did not respond to their invitation. So it's a bigger number. It goes from 2,600 to about 3,300. So still a lot of, a lot of work to do within the study area. Um, and I think that's probably, you know, my, my notes for, that I provide to Ms. Forty will, will have some additional information, but it's largely information that I provided previously. So it'll be reflected in the notes and in the minutes that she provides, but I'm not sure given the time that I need to review that again this time, but I'd be happy to field any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Wimsett. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Wimsat? None. Thank you very much for your report. Um, I'd like to ask Dr. Bush if she could give an update from DAHHS, please. Yes, hi, thank you. So in general, I'd like to provide updates on some of our ongoing collaborative work around the Apple Tree Grant funded by CDC ATSDR. So I can say um, we've been working closely to support recruitment for their PEAS, PFAS health study. And while I know that is not specific to Southern New Hampshire, as I've said before, the, the science that we'll learn from that will be important for any population exposed to PFAS. And so we've been supporting recruitment efforts there, um, including just trying to increase awareness of those studies and eligibility criteria to participate. And so again, any of you who, um, want to promote that, that study through your networks, I encourage you to do that, particularly just where your networks reach people who are, are interested and committed uh, to, to PFAS and learning more about the health impacts of PFAS. If 
it's of interest, I can share some social media posts that have been created that we are sharing that I think people could then circulate or at least have talking points <laughs> should you be in venues um, to share and promote that information. Also related to the ATSDR work, you, you know and will recall that ATSDR is working on two specific risk assessments for the Merrimack area, one on public water and one on private water. And unfortunately, those reports are still sort of in the clearance process. What I can tell you is that there's a data validation step that needs to happen where they work actually with, with New Hampshire DES, sort of validating the data that goes into those risk assessments as part of the clearance process. And that those conversations have been happening recently, I think since we met last, which indicates to me that it's one step closer to being released. And so I guess I would make the kind of point that as Mike and DES and maybe the education outreach subcommittees are all working to plan these public meetings that we also circle back to ATSDR. There may be an opportunity then to also plan meetings around the release of these risk assessments. Mm -hmm. And then I also wanted to let you all know related to the ATSDR apple tree grant, we have a new position at the health department that we are calling an environmental health coordinator. They will be responsible for supporting much of the outreach and education activities related to the apple tree grant and supporting DES, for example, with things like public meetings. And so we're excited to be moving forward with that hiring process. They'll also be responsible for engaging stakeholders like healthcare providers, which I know is a key interest of this commission, as well as SB 85. So I just wanted to let you know that we, we will have new capacity within the health department really focused on environmental health communication and risk communication. And to that end, I was actually just on the phone this morning with the New England Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit in Boston, just sort of brainstorming and sharing ideas about how our two programs can work together to support some additional training and outreach um, for both child care providers, which is a, a focus of our grant work, but also health care providers. And so I don't have any results to share. But just to let you know that there's sort of some capacity building going on here in that area, which relates really directly to some of the core goals of this group related to education and outreach. So that's exciting in terms of sort of new resources and new expertise. And then specific last time you all believe, I feel like I'm always saying there are things in the pipeline I lost. And I, I promise things really are in the pipeline. So one of the things in the pipeline is the biomonitoring trace summary report, which you'll remember the 2019 trace study is the New Hampshire tracking and assessment of chemical exposures across New Hampshire. It represents nearly 350 individuals. Um, and so I do have an update from Amanda Kosser, the biomonitoring program manager that I will just read and I will submit to um, to the clerk to, to include in the minutes, but it says, Dear HB 737 committee, thanks for your interest in the 2019 trace study. It is the first surveillance biomonitoring study to cover the state of New Hampshire. 50 chemicals were evaluated in blood, serum, and urine from non-institutionalized New Hampshire residents who are at least six years old, living in the state for at least six months. Mm -hmm. So we also offered household water testing paired with this biomonitoring testing and they've collaborated with the Department of Environmental Services to get those water tests. It's really a great collaboration across many programs in the two agencies. And so we've really, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but once final, it will be shared broadly with trace participants, all of you program stakeholders and the public. So I imagine there may be a public webinar, but Mandy then in the email to me also made it very clear that she is excited to come present these results with you as soon as the report is finalized and cleared. So also we will be working to put the report and aggregated results on our public health data portal. Um, that will take some time once the report is finalized, but we definitely share the value of sort of public access to data and information. And so wanted to make sure that you all knew that would be a priority once these reports were finalized. And in her letter, there is also a link just to the landing page for the study where you can learn more. And so that was submitted by Amanda Kosser, the Biomonitoring Program Administrator. And we will stay in touch about that. I can um, provide another update next month where hopefully the report is 
nearing um, final sign off. That's my goal. Um, I think those were all my updates. Any questions? Are there any questions for Dr. Bush? Okay, um, great. Thank you very much, Dr. Bush. Um, before we adjourn, um, a couple things, well, a few things. One is um, I had a response from Dr. Bean regarding the letter we approved a few months ago regarding uh, the blood sample retention. And she's going to have a response to us for our April meeting. They have not completed that response yet. So look for that for the April meeting. Um, also, um, I'm going to ask uh, representatives from our federal delegation offices if they want to give an update. I know there's a lot of movement going on at the federal level regarding regulation and uh, um, just legislation around PFAS short update as well as um, reports from our health subcommittee, environmental subcommittee, and communication subcommittee. So that, that's what I have on the agenda for our April meeting. Also, um, um, kind of getting to Representative Mooney's uh, point before, it, we are gonna be um, opening up the uh, legislative calendar for LSRs in November. And that's also the time where we'll be preparing our interim study report or interim report. And when we did that last year, if you remember, we uh, spent, I think it was in late summer, developing what our recommendations were gonna be, our legislative recommendations. I, I'd like us to kind of start that earlier. So we have those recommendations in place before the November report, because if we wait until the November report, it might be too late. So probably not in April, but um, maybe in May and June, we can um, start to, compile what we want to see be introduced for the fall, uh, the second year of the biennium. Okay, so if that's good. And then um, one other thing before we schedule our next meeting, which to me, if we look at, if we hold to the second Friday of the month would be April 9th. So April 9th um, at 10 o'clock. Um, now, uh, I think that we may have to change that because I believe we might have session that day. Uh, rep, rep, yes. 7th, 8th, and 9th, yes. Yeah, so can we push that meeting to April 16th then? Is there any opposition to that? We're having a very rare Friday session day. Um, so. I, uh, I will have a conflict on the 16th. You do, uh, Dr. Bush? I think many of us sit on SB 85, which generally meets from 10 to 12 that oh, okay. day. And so I would just potentially request that maybe we meet 9 to 11 so some of us can yeah. break okay. <laughs> if um, that was the date we chose. Or if we, if, we, if we stick with the ninth, I wonder if we can go maybe in the afternoon. Um, does anybody have a conflict with that? Session would probably... I don't know, Representative Mooney, do you have any idea when we would finish up on Friday? My thought, Madam Chair, is um, based on the speaker's message in the journal or in the calendar, is that the sports complex has been reserved for all three days all day. So that's my only indicator to recommend that we not meet on the 9th. Okay, at all, all right. So, um, and the 16th doesn't look good. So that either would, we'd either meet um, perhaps on the 23rd, it's kind of delayed, but um, it's two weeks after we would normally meet, but does that day work for everyone? Since the 9th is out, there is that conflict with the other commission on the, well, on the 16th, I'm sorry, Dr. Bush, what did you say, what time does that commission meet? It, yeah, it doesn't conflict. It's just from 10 to uh, 12 to 2. So we could meet oh, from oh, okay. 10 to noon. So what I was going to just propose that we do 9 to 11 if that was possible. Yeah. Okay. Does that work? Okay. So we'll meet April 16th, 9 to 11. Okay. okay and I just checked too. And actually my, my schedule starts at one o'clock on the 16th. So that great. should be great. All right. Great. So we'll just move it up an hour. Thank you very much. Um, and then the last thing. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, one thing, uh, Representative Ron, uh, the 16th is fiscal. 
So oh. from from ten till noon. Okay. Oh, wait, hang on a second. It's uh, yeah, it's the third. So so fiscal will be meeting on the sixteenth. Okay. And what time did they? What time will they start? You said they go from ten till noon. And then uh, Senate Finance has uh, presentations by departments starting at one that afternoon. Okay. You know, I wonder, is there any opposition if we go 8.30 to 10.30? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Is that, does that work for you, Mr. Wimsat? I couldn't really tell. Okay. All right. Let's go 8.30 to 10.30. Okay. All right, and hopefully the committee reports will be concise. Great. Um, the last thing I want to mention is Miss Forty had mentioned before the commission meeting started that she's moving. Um, and yeah, next session, so that if we meet on the 16th, that would be my last meeting with you guys. Oh, I'm crushed. All right. Um, I will work. I believe that position is uh, appointed by the Senate president. So um, perhaps between Senator Carson and Senator Daniels, um, we can work on asking President Morse about um, uh, appointing a replacement, which would be the following, it would be for the May meeting. Um, Ms. Forty, I, I, I can't express enough my appreciation for you taking the minutes. These will be your last minutes. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I, oh, actually, we'll get you in April too, so. Uh, Yes, Representative Mooney. Thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, just to be clear, Ms. Forty, you'll not be moving to Merrimack or Bedford. <laughs> I'm trying no. to think of every angle, Madam <laughs> Chair. Oh, we'll Litchfield now. <laughs> yeah. Very. Yeah. I well, am uh, actually I'm moving um to right outside Phoenix to Glendale, Arizona. Okay. Um oh, where they goodness. actually just discovered quite a lot of PFOA at the Air Force Base there. So I will be doing a lot of work. Oh boy. All right. I've done everything I can to keep her on as clerk. So I'll so <laughs> good thank effort. You. Thank you. Okay. So um with that, and I believe uh, Governor Sununu has done us a great favor. He signed an executive order that we don't need a roll call for adjourning. So um <laughs> I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Moved by Senator Daniels. Is there a second? Second. second. I should ask, did anyone have anything else they wanted to share before we adjourned? I'm sorry. I'm still shell shocked that we're losing this 40. Okay, so we have a motion to adjourn. Just uh, signify uh, by saying aye to approve. Aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you very much. We'll see you April 16th at 8.30 a.m. And you'll be Thank hearing- Thank you for coming on for a great meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Have a great weekend.